people have heroes of the faith that they look up to, that they consider as great men of God. George Mueller was considered a great man of faith. Charles Spurgeon was considered a great man of God, the people's pastor. Um, I know, I'm trying to think of some other ones that I know of, um, personally. But these men, each and every one of them, were men. I mean, they were used of God at particular times in their life, and they demonstrated something special and something unique about the Spirit of God working in a man to reveal God in the flesh. In other words, they became more than who they were. They became the fulfillment of God's promise to you and to I that we, should we give our lives over to God, should we accept that which God had promised us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, then He would use us, even the weakest link, the least of all His brethren, the least of men on earth, God would use to make the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And I've been witnessing that lately, again, in my life. Not that I'm anybody special, but I've just been able to bear witness to the truth, to the fact of what the Bible says is true, to the fact of what God has done miraculously in latter days. When I got saved, I got saved in the height and the heyday of the Jesus movement. I got saved in a time where everyone around me was like, wow, glowing. Miracles were happening. I mean, things were occurring that were blowing people's minds. Even raising dead, people trying to walk on water. I tried, I went swimming. <laughs> Didn't work so well, oh well. But believe me, other miracles, oh yeah. God speaking direct, yes he can, he does. But I met and I was a part of a contemporary Christian movement that was called the Jesus Movement, the Jesus Freaks. You know, in Southern California, I was there at the heyday. I got a chance to see men of God that I was just in awe of as they hit their prime as they hit their stride, as they seem to go right on, almost as though it were the staircase to heaven and marching right up into heaven's door, you know, and calling down God for more and God giving it. I remember some nights at Chuck Smith's studies, you know, on a Sunday night when you knew, you just knew that the Lord was coming that night because Chuck was on fire. Chuck was like over the top. He was out there beyond what anybody would have thought that he would have said or did. I remember all these different things occurring at that time and the amazing thing of how people either didn't know it at the time or felt like they were like on the cusp of something happening, a new age was coming, something's going to occur. I remember the believers meeting when it first started at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa on a Wednesday night. It was like, ooh, goosebumps. I remember Ernie Rutino being on the piano one time and going inside the believers meeting and boy, sharing some things that were like, I remember Ernie and Debbie being there at times. I remember T. Thornton, Rick Boyer, Malcolm Wilde, Romaine, um, men of God that were just coming up into their stride, into the fullness of the ministry that God was giving them. Chuck Missler, um, gosh, everywhere around me. I mean, there were just people that were like, man, I was like in the shadows of like, these tall, statuesque men of God that were actually, a lot of them were just kind of like, you know, everyday rappers, you know, kind of like talking like me and visiting with you. But they were in their stride. They were like sharing things that were so right on, we kept tapes of them. As a matter of fact, the times that some of these tapes are, I was there. I remember it. I was like, oh yeah, I know that tape. <laughs> or that book. Yeah, that book's that tape. I know that one. I know where that quote came from. But the joy of seeing that it was like, oh, as though we were men of old and we saw the, the temple that Solomon built. And it was like, wow. It was like a highway to the sky. And Keith Green was around even in those days. Or second chapter of Acts. And I remember Friday night concerts. And I remember Love Song. And all these things. And Sweet Comfort Band. And gosh, it was just like constant bombardment of just amazing things coming out. Even when the first time that Psalms Alive came out and they opened it up to the demonstration to Calvary, you know, at Anaheim Convention Center, just saying, we're going to introduce something new at Calvary. And suddenly, out of the audience, half of them went forward and began to sing. And it was like, wow. We were like, ooh, goosebumps. 
Man, those were the days, my friends. We thought they'd never end. We'd sing and dance forever and a day. I remember even the Jewish Gentile, Jewish Gentile, what was it called? The Christian Fellowship? Jewish Fellowship? I don't remember. But it was like meeting there together at Calvary. Or the first time a woman taught at Calvary. <gasps> a woman teacher? Oh, no. God forbid. And she taught men. <gasps> Wednesday night Bible school. School of the Bible. Hey, I was there. <laughs> wow. Broke stereotypes. Chuck loved to do things like that. Whatever the Spirit led, God did. You know, and Chuck was very into that. And I remember so many different people that I met at the times, and they went on to be, wow, you know, saints, so to speak. And I was always in awe of the people I was around. I was just like, wow, you know, and I was kind of like, ooh, ooh, and just soaking it in like a sponge, being blessed, being given the gift of what their experiences and their knowledge and their growing had taught them from the Lord, how God was using them to inspire the Word of God so that I would rush after it with all I had. I even drove over 60, 70 miles to get to where I wanted to study. And then when I got there, I had to live there because I couldn't drive back. I didn't have enough money. I was hungry in those days. But boy, man, I started going to church seven days a week. Seven days a week. Had to live in my car to do it. But hey, for a couple months, it's Southern Cal. We can do it. And I did it. And then I got into with some roommates that were like, you know, going to Calvary, some of them, and some of them were AOG. And I remember getting involved in other ministries at the time when TBN was first starting to grow, before it became what it is today. That could be good or bad. Or like Crystal Cathedral, before it became, you know, Crystal Cathedral, when it was first to drive in. Or Maranatha Village, you know, kind of how it was. And I used to have this poster from there, you know. And I remember a lot of things, you know, from those days. And it was like, wow. You know, and when I was gone and went out, you know, into the field, so to speak, of the world and got stomped on, <laughs> wasn't all so organized back in those days either. You know, some of us went out and got like, oh, you know. But, hey, God still used these men of God, even with their failings sometimes or their successes. And even when the divisions came later and there were strifes and, you know, kind of like turmoils, it still was these men of God that were going on in the ministry, in the Lord. And you know, I kind of I kind of never really had what I have today. You know, what I have had and I'm jealous over with a great jealousy that I just like, oh, I don't want to I don't want to touch it. I don't want to influence it. I don't want it to be changed from who he is in the Lord and what God is doing in his life because I see what is happening. And I know and I bear witness to it that God is filling a man to the capacity with which he can be filled. That he is overflowing with the Spirit of God. And I, I've known men of God in their realms of what they're doing, you know, and how they can fill up that ministry they've been given. I remember one pastor that I worked with that was probably the greatest on-the-fly worship leader I've ever met. You know, I mean, he just... You know, he was awesome. I mean, he came out of... Uh, Applegate Christian Fellowship, a guy by the name of Bob Langfield, one of the most powerful, anointed, appointed worship leaders I've ever met. Pastoring, yeah, not so good, but you know, hey, as a worship leader, man, the guy was awesome. You could not beat what he was in worship. I mean, he just, he was the only one I know that could ruin a song and make it better than what it was. <laughs> and it was true. Everyone that used to listen was blessed. And it was just like Keith Green. When he went to record, eh, not so good. But you know what? When it was live, oh, wow, the Spirit of God moved. Now, as a pastor, he was okay. He started churches, you know, and he's got a, a legacy left behind him, you know. And there's been some good, you know, a lot of good. And there's also some things, you know, but, you know, everybody's got kind of, you know. But the point being is that, man, when it came to filling up the fullness of what he was, him and his wife, you could not be for leading worship. And I'd seen them all. <laughs> Believe me, when the early days of, you know, Maranatha music and everything else, I'd seen all the worship things come along. And these guys were good. Then I saw, you know, different men of God, you know, that were like either structured, that they filled up, you know, the fullness of the structure of what God could do in a man that was trained in the ministry, like John Corson. Whoa! 
once he was given the foundation of what God wanted to do in his life, he was gone. And he still is, out in Applegate. Awesome, magnificent, great Bible scholar. And I think about Missler and how Missler kind of, you know, he goes off on his tangents, but you know, still Missler's Missler, and if you know Missler, you know. You know what I mean? You don't have to worry about Missler. He's like, well, he may be out on the field half the time or in right field, but he still knows his Bible and he knows the Lord. But these men filled up, moved up into the stature of what God wanted them to be, completely overflowing with just awesomeness of what God is, not who they are. And that's what I'm finding now today in my life. You know, I I almost feel guilty because I said, you know, Lord, I've been with, you know, the latest, greatest, you know, incarnation of what you want to do with these men of God that seem to be, you know, carnal or fleshy or, you know, they've got their own little kind of shtick, you know, that they want ministry or they want this, that, or the other thing. But, you know, Jesus, I don't see them wanting you. I don't see them talking about you. I don't see that which I had with you in the Jesus movement and that I've had with you all my life. I want a man that I could sit down with my wife and say, yes, and not have to say no. I want a man that I could just kind of like kick back and just grin and just smile and just enjoy the Word of God purely as though it were from Jesus Himself speaking His own lips to my own ears. I know You, Lord. I know Your voice. I know Your heart. Because You've touched mine and You've spoken to me direct. And I've heard God's voice direct. And you know, what you have, it's like everything else is less. And you just want that over and over and over again. And you just, the times that you get involved in other things, it's like, it just isn't the same. It's not the purity. It's not the holiness. It's not the overflowing of joy. The all-encompassing manifestation of the presence of peace. It's not that love that goes also out there to capture people's lives and lives. And you know, I'm sorry to say this man of God is kept hidden away. But I'm not sorry to say it either. Because you see, he has gone out. He does do things. And those with which they recognize hear the word of God and are changed. But little do people recognize sometimes right in their midst what a great and powerful man of God they may have right there with them. And that moment in time when he's used and anointed of God to such a great degree, I do. And I can't wait till we all go home so we don't see the future, know what may happen to all these kinds of men of God. But this man, I am so blessed to be in his presence. I am so honored to have the joy of seeing the Lord in him. To bear witness and to bear testimony. To say, this is the gospel. This is the Word of God. This is what God intended a man to be. And so when I talk about Rich Chaffin, when I talk about Calvary Chapel, Laguna Creek, I'm not talking about as though he were the only one. Because you see, God brought me to him to remind me of the whole Elijah thing, because I've been sent out to do the things I do. Sometimes it's been in faraway places that people can't go or things that people can't do because they're married or have children or they have this, that, or the other thing, or they're in ministry or whatever. But, you know, I was the one that was dying, and I was the one that was suffering, and I was the one that would go, hey, you know what? You stay here and take care of those. I'll go find a 99 or the one or whatever. And God's used him in that same capacity in some ways. And the Spirit has brought those that are beaten up and weakened and, you know, of a, of a nature that they need to feel the refreshment of God's love for them. And so I'm blessed by this man of God, and I bear witness to testimony to who he is because of what God has done. But I had also prayed, Lord, give me normalcy. Give me the man that has grown up in the Lord, that has gone the right way, has gone the straight and narrow, who has walked with you, Jesus, all the way, who has taken you the rest of the way, who now has shown and demonstrated in his life what it is to have a life that's committed to you every day. I found the man. And there's others out there, so don't get me wrong, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, try to blow smoke up this man's, you know, ministry or try to con you into thinking something more than what this man is, because I know who it is that's in him. It's Jesus. I have no problem with that. That's obvious <laughs> once you hear the teaching. And as you 
hear the life story, you know, everybody's got a story. You know, it's good. It's such, you know, I mean, we have a lot of testimony of what the flesh is and was and what it is today and what it's going to be. You know, and I, you know, I admire all the ministry teachings that always say, you know, well, walk the talk. You know, I'm just like, yeah, if you're a hypocrite, walk the talk. But you know what? My walk is my talk. And my talk is my walk. And it's not that I'm walking my talk. It's that I'm living the grace that I've been given. I'm sharing the grace with you. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm saying, hey, you know what? I fall into sin. And you know what? I'll dive into and dive out just as fast. Ooh, that's cold water. I'm out of there. Ooh, that's hot water. I'm out of there. I don't want to do that no more. And pray and ask God accordingly. And he'll lead me out of it, away from it, and keep me from it. And still redeem me on the day of salvation to the glory of God as Father because he loves me. But you see, there's some that I'd wanted to be able to look at and say, what if I didn't die? What if God had not allowed me the privilege of having these dying diseases that have plagued me all my life, that have taken me from one tragic experience to another, that have crushed me and broken me at many times in my life and caused me to question even living? What if I didn't live like that? What would it have been like with what I was given? when I got saved. Because I've always looked at, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. And it was like, wow, I got saved. And I mean, it was like... You know, and until I had found that poem that talked about others may, you may not, and that God has reserved for you a special, you know, kind of like unique things that he wants you to have a particular intimacy with him and requires of that intimacy sometimes the way of suffering, then you kind of don't get it. You know, you don't get it that how you might be, you know, like going a little bit different, you know. Sometimes God's going to use that because, you know, He wants you to be a little bit different, you know. It might not be quite the normal, you know, cookie cutter. But I wanted to see what the cookie looks like. You know, I didn't want to see these cheap imitations that are store-bought. I wanted to see what the Spirit of God had wrought with what God had done in a man. And so... Now, at the end of my life, and I do feel like we're at the end of the age, so I can say the end of my life. I'm not dying tomorrow, although I could. Who knows? May get killed. You know, <laughs> praise the Lord. I'd be happy dead tomorrow. <laughs> but I wanted my wife, because I had involved her in different portions of ministry with other pastors, with other teachers, with other people that are, quote unquote, supposed to be men of God. And sadly, Though she understands grace, she also has her own personal opinion about these types of people that God is still training up or learning up or growing up into the ministry, into accomplishing eventually that with which he wants, or just simply extending grace upon them so that they'll, they'll make it anyways, and that she'll be able to understand that there's grace for her too, because she's not perfect. But I also wanted her to see what there has to be in the reality of those that do grow up in the Lord, that do follow hard after God, that press in to press on with Jesus every day of their life, wanting Him, and to reveal and to know Him, to have an experience of God every day. Like Chuck used to say, don't get out of bed unless the Spirit of God leads you that way. Ask Him and to follow Him and to seek Him and to do what God had told you to do. And you know, like I said, there is a man of God I met finally, and the Lord brought me. And I'm humbled. It doesn't take much to humble me. You see, I can easily step back and say, Wow, I just, I just, if, if there was ever anything I could do, you know, to, to help, I would. Lay down my life, give you my wife, you know, so to speak. <laughs> That's an old joke. <laughs> Lay down my life, give you my wife, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> okay, Lord, you know, I'm going to follow you and leave my wife behind. But, no, I'm amazed, I'm blessed, I'm encouraged. I'm rejoicing in the work that God has done in a man that he calls his son. And I see it, and I see the ministry that, though it's small, it's still mighty in the Lord in many ways that I'm sure maybe they don't know. <laughs> but as one who has seen the great ministries and the little ministries and the big ministries and the some ministries and whatever ministries, I can only say, I'm blessed because it's not about ministry. 
I'm really blessed because it's not about men or women or families. Although this is a faithful man of God, he's grown up in his family unit, he has maintained his relationship with his wife, he has raised his children, they are godly, they are moving forward, they are doing that with which God intended them to do, and I'm sure they go through their own trials and tribulations too. But I'm blessed because the message that I've seen, that I bear witness to, over 40 days now, that I can say this is what he teaches, is Jesus. Pure and simple. It's Jesus beginning. It's Jesus in the end. Whether you agree or not doesn't matter to me. But you see, that's the difference between what the testimony I'm giving and the witness that I'm declaring and the word of my testimony for this man of God, that man with God, this man that God is using, is that if you want to see Jesus, if you want to hear someone who knows Jesus, if you want to hear someone that Jesus is revealing himself in, then let me tell you, would you please seek out and find Rich Chafin in the ministry that he's involved in? Because you may find that is what God wants you to hear. Not about Rich, but about his son. And if you really want to hear about Jesus, just go and listen or go and talk to Rich Chaffin. The ministry, the man, and the word of God being proclaimed faithfully at Calvary Chapel to Green Creek.